Shalom again. This is Reverend John Ferret, and welcome to session three in this podcast series called The Archaeology of Passover. In this session, our main focus is going to be on the resurrection. I want to ask ourselves the question, why Sunday? Uh, why not Monday? Or why not on the Sabbath? Why not on Saturday? You can study about the Sabbath in the Torah, and you find out that the Sabbath from God's perspective, is a sign between him and his people. A sign. A covenant sign. On top of that, the Sabbath is the most important of the biblical feast in Leviticus 23. We'll be dealing with that in another podcast. So, did the Jewish people know something that we don't with regards to that Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead? Oh, yes. <laughs> So again, let's walk those ancient paths, those ancient streets, and ask the question, what did they hear? What did they see? What did they understand? And as we reconnect the historical context of the resurrection, it'll become even more, more of an explosive event for us. Now, when we deal with Passover and we deal with archaeology of the Passover, there's so much to teach. Uh, like, where is the Garden of Gethsemane? Or where was the trial of Jesus before Pilate? Some say it was in the Antonia Fortress. Others, like me, I believe it was at the Herod's Palace, which was west of the temple about one mile. When you actually go to the website, www.lightamenorah.org, Lighta Menorah, one word, Menorah is spelled M-E-N-O-R-A-H, Light of Menorah, one word, dot org. In the session description for this session you'll find links to two videos one of them is about is my my video that addresses the idea of where is the garden of gethsemane and the second one is done by an amazing and proven bible historian and scholar and archaeologist joel kramer of the associates of biblical research which is a group of evangelical bible historians and archaeologists to again help us see the credibility of the Bible. They are an amazing, amazing, amazing group. Joel shows us the location via real archaeology of the likely location of where Jesus' trial was. You'll be fascinated. Now for us, the archaeology strengthens our trust in the Bible. Its veracity, its truthfulness, its reliability. It gives us a strong case to present to the doubters or the unbelievers or the skeptics. But we have a problem with us. God talks about it in Genesis 6-5 and then again in Genesis 8-21 that there is this inclination to sin. That the intentions and inclinations of our heart are to sin constantly. And so Jesus said, even the skeptics, many skeptics won't believe, even if someone was raised from the dead. So we're not surprised that even with biblical archaeology, even with the facts that indeed there are people, even among fellow Christians, who debate and argue and can't accept the real facts of real archaeology and real science, the real truth of God's word. So in this session, we're going to focus in on the resurrection. And the first thing I want to do is I want to focus in on the tomb of Jesus. The tombs in Jesus' day were very unique and distinct. Most of them are caves, and they have a rolling stone uh, in front of them to close them off, or a stone that was like a plug that would plug into the entrance to the cave. Once you were in, you stepped into a carved-out area, um, carved-out floor you might say and as you walked into this carved out area there'd be a shelf on the left or a shelf on the right or shelves on the left and right or there could be one in front or on all sides depending on uh, how they carved out the uh, tomb they were all about waist high because you're walking down in this carved out area and these shelves for the bodies are uh, about waist high there's holes in the walls behind the shelves. They're called kokim. Oh, the bodies were put on the shelves, and the family and friends would mourn in the dugout area. 
After one year, they would come back. They would open up the tomb, and the bones were put in a bone box, which is called an ossuary. And that ossuary, that bone box, was then slid into one of those holes, one of the kokim. At the website, there's a great article by Ray Vanderland, who was my first teacher in Israel um, oh, so many years ago. And again, you can find it at the website www.lightamenorah.org and there's a link to his article that really deals with the tomb of Jesus and the burial of Jesus. I think you'll find it fascinating. Also, I've linked you to a folder with has numbers of pictures of tombs in Jesus' day. Burial tombs of the first century AD. We call that the second temple period. Now, in relation to this, there's a popular place that many people visit in Jerusalem, and it's called the Garden Tomb. In 1974, it was excavated by professional Jewish and Christian archaeologists, and what they discovered about the Garden Tomb, it was a tomb from Iron Age II. Now, for us, that means about the 7th or 8th century B.C., 700 years roughly before Jesus. It was used then. Clearly, archaeology shows that the garden tomb was never used in Jesus' day. Matter of fact, the garden tomb is in the midst of a number of other tombs that they found that were used in the Byzantine era, in the 3rd, 3rd or 4th century A.D., so the garden tomb was used in the 7th and 8th century BC, reused only in the Byzantine area, because it's in the midst of a cemetery of tombs of the Byzantine period. Now the garden tomb, there are several key characteristics that we need to address. One, in the garden tomb there are no kokim, holes to insert the ossuaries. And in Jesus' day, all tombs in Jesus' day had the kokim, had the holes for the ossuaries. The garden tomb also doesn't exhibit an arcosolium. These are arches where the body is actually laid. There's a number of tombs in Jesus' day that have that arch over the place where, or the shelf where the body would lay. And many tombs in Jesus' day had such an arch. Now, for the garden tomb in the 8th or 7th century BC, there were benches for the mourners to enter the tomb, the cave, and those benches were around a sunken floor, a carved out sunken floor, where the body would be. So you can see all these people sitting on the bench looking down at the body that was in the sunken, carved out sunken floor. That's 7th or 8th century BC. However, in Jesus' day, the tombs are just the opposite. The benches or the shelves are carved around the sunken floor, and the bodies are put on the shelves. And the mourners are standing in the sunken area. So everything is just the reverse in terms of the tombs in Jesus' day. Also, the tombs in Jesus' day used a special chisel. It had unique cut marks. All of the tombs, there was a special chisel that the uh, stone carvers would actually use. The garden tomb in its entirety exhibits none of those cuts. It was not cut in the second temple period. It was not cut in Jesus' day. I've also linked you to uh, an excellent video. And the presenter is Dr. Gabriel Barkai, he's an esteemed Israeli archaeologist. He's a professor at Bar Elan University in Tel Aviv. And when you watch that video, it he proves conclusively that the garden tomb is not the tomb of Jesus. The tomb actually probably is at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And I say probably because archaeology shows that the evidence strongly suggests that Jesus' tomb at, is, is at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. But even then, to actually prove it conclusively, more work still needs to be done. Now, why is all of this important? We're dealing with the resurrection. 
garden tomb. Well, first of all, the garden tomb was discovered by a pseudo-archaeologist, General Gordon, back in the 1800s. He had an interest in archaeology. He was not trained in archaeology. And for him, finding the area that he thought was Golgotha, finding the tomb, it just looked right. There has never been any proof offered at all, even today, that the garden tomb is a tomb that would have been used in Jesus' day. And like I said, real archaeology, both Christian and Jewish uh, scholars, strongly suggest that indeed uh, the crucifixion and burial of Jesus happened, uh, you might say, under the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It fits perfectly because they found first century tombs also in that area. This supports John 19.41. In John 19, verse 41, and like I said, archaeology must support this, it says that the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea was in the same place as the crucifixion. There was a garden close by. So within walking distance? So why this is, all of this is important, it gives us the fact that the Bible is credible and true with real archaeology, real science, by real profession, professionals. And they demonstrate again and again the truth of God's word. Now let's deal with the resurrection itself. And we ask, okay, we see the picture of Jesus as the Lamb of God. We can associate that with the Passover Lamb Jesus' death as the Lamb of God, we are delivered from the bondage of the slavery of our sin. Uh, the Jewish people were delivered from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. We can see how these are pictures of each other, but the Exodus and the Passover meal, they stand on their own as a critically important event in all of our history. But how does the resurrection fit in? What does it do for the Passover of the Messiah? Why is it critical to the overall redemption plan that God actually seemingly starts in the, in, the, in the garden, in the book of Genesis? I'm indebted to uh, Harold Gandhi. Uh, he is a guy who got a master's degree in divinity, and he wrote a paper on the resurrection according to Scripture. And also Dr. Jeff Robinson, a Ph.D., a pastor, an editor of a uh, website and blog page called the Gospel Coalition. He wrote a paper, If Christ is Not Raised. Now in uh, Harold Gandhi's paper, you can look this up on the uh, website. Gandhi is spelled G-A-N-D-I. It's Harold Gandhi. And again, the paper is entitled uh, The Resur Resurrection According to the Scriptures. In his paper, he shows that the resurrection of the dead is predicted not only in the Bible, but also in Jewish culture. I didn't say the resurrection of the Messiah. I said the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead is a belief that was held by many Jews in Jesus' day. There was the great philosopher of Judaism, Philo, great secular Jewish philosopher, and he talked in his own writings about the first death and the second death. All people, the righteous and the unrighteous, the godly and the ungodly, will succumb to the first death. That's just normal death. However, they will arise and they will come to judgment and the unrighteous, the ungodly, will face the second death. Now this is interesting because you can read about the second death in the writings of Philo or the only other place is the book of Revelation. You can find this in Revelation chapter 2, I think it's verse 11. Uh, chapter 20, verse 6, chapter 20, verse 14, 
chapter 21, verse 8. John is using the phrase, the second death. So in Jesus' day, Philo and John, the book of Revelation, are showing that there is a concept that people knew about and was called the second death after the judgment of God upon the righteous and the unrighteous, and the second death follows the resurrection. That's amazing. So again, here we see this concept that in Jesus' day, there was a belief in the resurrection. Here's another one. In the book of Maccabees, both 1 Maccabees and 2 Maccabees, these books were written roughly, roughly about 100 B.C. 1 Maccabees, it's suggested by the scholars about 100 B.C. 2 Maccabees, about 124 B.C. So, well over 100 years before Jesus. And in 2 Maccabees chapter 7, there is a family that is being persecuted by the evil king Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Seven brothers are brought up before the king, and the king wants them to eat pork, to, to break Torah. They didn't. All of the seven brothers were martyred in a terrible way. But here's a statement of one of the brothers before he died. He says, and this is in 2 Maccabees chapter 7, starting in about verse 9. With his last breath, he said, fiend though you are, meaning Antiochus IV Epiphanes, fiend though you are, you are setting us free from this present life. And since we die for his laws, we die for the Torah, the king of the universe will rise us up to a life everlasting made new. A little bit later in the same chapter, his brother is at the point of death. This is in verse 14. He too, at the last moment of his life, he yells out to the king, better to be killed by men and cherish God's promise to rise us again. For there will be no resurrection for you. Later on in 2 Maccabees, we're reading about Judas the Maccabee, the hero of the Maccabee revolt, the hero of Hanukkah, you might say. And this is in chapter 12, verse 43. A number of uh, Jews had been buried, and Judas levied a contribution, verse 43 of um, chapter 12 in 2 Maccabees. He levied a contribution for each man and sent the, to the total of 2,000 silver drachmas to Jerusalem for a sin offering, a fit and proper act in which he took the account, which he took into account of the resurrection. For if he had not been expecting the fallen to rise again, it would have been foolish and superfluous to pray for the dead. So here in the book of Maccabees, we already see that in the Jewish culture, 100 to 200 B.C., the concept of the resurrection of the dead was already something very common, a uh, common belief among the Jewish people. We remember Paul's trial before the Sanhedrin in Acts 23, that the Pharisees and, Sa and Sadducees get in an argument. Paul knew this. The Pharisees sa said, yes, there is the resurrection of the dead, and the Sadduc Sadducees say no. So this confirms what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 4. And Paul says that Jesus will be raised from the dead according to Scripture. What Scripture? Not the New Testament, ladies and gentlemen. 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, these books were written in 56 to 57 AD, there was no New Testament. All they had was the Hebrew Scriptures. All they had was the Old Testament. So again, resurrection, the resurrection of dead is an Old Testament concept. It's, it's, we got to get reconnected to our Jewish roots to understand this. And in Gandhi's article, you'll see, for instance, that uh, it's seemingly proven in the book of Isaiah. Now, religious Jewish writers... And this is in, uh, found in the book by Raphael Pate, the Messiah texts, as he outlines Jewish, religious Jewish writers. They believed Messiah must be killed, but he must live again to take the throne of David in Jerusalem. So if there's no resurrection, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament is wrong. Now, turning to Dr. Robinson's paper, he talks about the question, 
What if there is no resurrection? So not only do we see the resurrection of the dead, first of all, is a Jewish concept that most people believed in Jesus' day, and certainly we do. But the second thing is, what's the importance of the resurrection? So if there is no resurrection, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, what does it imply for us? Dr. Robinson bases his entire article on 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 34. I'm not going to read it in the podcast. You can read it for yourself. You can stop now and read 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 34, because all my comments now will be based on 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 34, but I'm going to throw in some extras like this. If there's no resurrection, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then Jesus is a liar. Let's go to Matthew 20, verses 18 and 19. We read, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and he will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. Then we go to Matthew 16, verses 21 through 23. And Jesus, or it says, From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's no resurrection, we just said Jesus is a liar. And therefore not God. If there's no resurrection... If there's no resurrection of the dead, the Jewish concept, then how can Messiah be raised from the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, the teaching, the preaching that we are doing is useless. It's vain. If there's no resurrection of the dead, we are liars and we're teaching against God. Now, this is an interesting concept that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 34. What he means is this. If there is no resurrection of the dead, in other words, if it's not in the Old Testament, and we're teaching about the resurrection of the dead, and we're teaching about the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, then we're liars and we're teaching against God. Because God, who inspired the writers of the Old Testament, inspired them to write that there was no resurrection, or there were no verses to support the resurrection. But... <laughs> So indeed, it's, it's, it's a little complex thought there. If there's no resurrection, our faith is worthless. And we're still in our sins. This is huge. What a connection between the cross and the tomb. If there's no resurrection, if the Jesus does not rise from the dead, we're still in our sins, and our sins have not been forgiven. If there's no resurrection, this is again according to Paul, and Dr. Robinson highlights this in his article, all who are already dead are condemned. They're doomed. If there's no res resurrection of the dead, all we have is this life. So let's eat, drink, be merry, party. That's all there is. For tomorrow you die and it's over. If there's no resurrection... If there's no resurrection of the dead, we're fools. And we should be pitied. Because all the skeptics, all the unbelievers, they'll have the last laugh. But he did rise from the dead. Not only is the concept of the resurrection of the dead predicted in the Hebrew scriptures, but on top of that, Jewish scholars, even from Jesus' day and after, looked upon the fact that said, Messiah must die, he must be killed, but he must come back to take the throne of David. And again, in Harold Gandhi's article, it talked about the fact of where in the Old Testament, where in the Hebrew Scriptures, does it talk about not only resurrection, but also the resurrection of the Messiah. By the way, I've also linked you to another article by Dr. D uh, Gary 
Gromaki. He is of the Associates of Biblical Research, like Joel Kramer. I mentioned Joel Kramer's uh, video that's uh, also linked here. And um, this is at the website for the Associates of Biblical Research. As I mentioned, these are evangelical uh, Bible scholars, historians, and also archaeologists. And so, indeed, this article is on the historicity of the resurrection. And it's not light reading. This is a serious study. Probably one of the most serious studies I have ever seen. Jesus rose from the dead. Our preaching is not in vain. And because he rises from the dead, we can have the guarantee that our sins are forgiven. Wow. Wow. But Jesus says something very interesting. I'm going to go to Luke 16, verse 31. And Jesus said, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. With all the historical proof, with all the biblical proof, it's still not going to be enough to perhaps convince skeptics and unbelievers. It really shows the tremendous, powerful effect our sin has upon our ears and our eyes and our hearts. Finally, let's talk about why Sunday? Why not Monday? Why not the Sabbath? Now, already we have seen a powerful connection between Palm Sunday and, Lamb's, and the Lamb Selection Day that's in Exodus chapter 12. And so in session two, it's quite clear as we look at that, knowing our Jewish roots definitely enhances our understanding of Palm Sunday. So is there something similar going on here? Is there something here that we don't see since we, the church, we've abandoned history and abandoned our Jewish roots? We have the basic understanding, don't get me wrong. The Bible is clear, but there's so much more behind this as we put the Bible in its historical context and try to walk those ancient streets as they did 2,000 years ago. If there is a true Palm Sunday, it must happen in 30 AD. It was Nisan 10. It could not happen in 33 AD based upon the moon, based upon astronomy, based upon the Jewish culture. It was basically totally impossible to be in 33 AD if there is a true Palm Sunday. Now, in Exodus 12, 3, God said it was Lamb Selection Day. This is the day that they were supposed to select their lamb in the first Passover back in Egypt. And so Palm Sunday is even more than we thought. Each father on Nisan 10 picked a lamb to kill on Passover. And the blood of that lamb would be put on the doorposts of the house, on the wood and we assign to the Lord, to Adonai, to pass over that house and to spare the firstborn. But so too, God the Father, on the first Palm Sunday, picked his son, the chosen one, as in, we read in 930, Luke 9.35. The Father said, this is my chosen one, chosen to be the Lamb of God, to be killed, and whose blood on the cross, on the wood, would be a sign, a sign to the Father that we too are to be passed over and saved from the bondage of sin. Now that's the picture that we see of Palm Sunday as we reconnect to our Jewish roots. Now on Resurrection Sunday, when Jesus rises from the dead, there is another picture. And again, we're going to reconnect to the Jewish culture. And it will add to our understanding of this amazing, powerful day. On the day after the Sabbath of Passover, there's another biblical feast. A better way of saying feast is appointed time. That's like what it says in the Hebrew. Now, we've gone through this in Lesson 1 and Lesson 2. Passover is the day the lambs are slain in Jerusalem. And then comes the first day of unleavened bread. The Pharisees said it was a Sabbath. It wasn't the Sabbath. I can understand where they're coming from, though. 
they could cook on this uh, they could cook on the first day of unleavened bread they, they were to cook the lamb roast it with fire but there is a statement that they were not to work so we probably could assume that the rabbis were doing something that they typically did and they put a fence around the torah they said this sounds like the sabbath so in order to do everything correctly in other words, to obey God correctly with regards to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We'll treat it as a Sabbath. I, I think that's what's going on. But his word, God's word, says it's not a Sabbath. Only for the simple reason, on the Sabbath, you cannot have a fire. So I'm going to go by God's word, not what a bunch of Pharisees said. I can understand. They probably had very good intentions. But based upon the Jewish culture, the way that's been communicated to us, all of a sudden we Christians say, see, uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread is, is a Sabbath. No, it's not. We need to understand that culture. So in Leviticus 23, verses 9 through 15, there's this other appointed time. And it's on the Sabbath of the feast. In other words, the Sabbath of Passover. There's the week of Passover, and some day during there, there's going to be a Saturday in there, and that's the Sabbath of Passover. So, in Leviticus 23, starting in verse 9, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and say to them, When you enter the land, which I'm going to give you, and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, one year old, without defect, for a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall then be two-tenths of an ephah, a fine flour mixed with oil, an offering by fire to the Lord for a soothing aroma with its drink offering, a fourth of a hint of wine. Until the same day, until you have brought in the offering of your God, you shall eat neither bread nor roasted grain nor new growth. It is to be a permanent statute throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. There are numbers of different ways that this appointed time, this feast, is named. One is called the uh, Feast of First Fruits or the Appointed Time of First Fruits, Moed Bikarim. It was the first harvest. In other words, the barley grain now was ripe for harvest. So sometimes it's called the Appointed Time or the Feast of the Omer. Omer is a Hebrew word standing for a sheaf. So if you're going to bring in a sheaf of barley uh, grain, you're actually going to cut down uh, a number of barley plants and bring a bunch in, a sheaf okay, of barley into the high priest. So the Feast of Bikarim, the Feast of the Omer, I'm going to keep on using the phrase uh, the Feast of Bikarim, the appointed time of Bikarim. It was appointed time to thank the Lord, thank him for the abundant grain, thank him for, for bread. Bread was considered in those days the food of life. Now, you needed to wait for the ceremony uh, to be over so that you can har finally begin harvest the barley, making it into flour, and baking the bread, barley loaves, of the new grain and finally selling it and eating it. But it must wait until after the Feast of Bikarim. Now, in Jesus' day, the priest made two loaves, two big loaves of unleavened barley bread. And they had a ceremony on that Sunday. And they lifted up the life-giving bread from the new grain. And they lifted it up before God. It was a time of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving that God has provided the harvest. That God has provided the food for life. So on this Sunday... Unleavened bread is lifted up before God, thanking God for the bread of life. But we remember what Jesus said 
In John 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. And then in verse 51, Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus said, he is the bread of life. He's saying he is the living bread. So on the day of the new harvest, when the unleavened loaves are lifted up, thanking God for the first fruits of the harvest, so too Jesus, our high priest, he himself is resurrected from the dead. He is lifted up. He's alive. And he appears before his Father in heaven. He's the bread of life with no sin, no leaven. It's just like the picture of the two loaves of unleavened barley bread lifted up before the Lord in the temple. Jesus is the bread of life with no leaven, no sin. All of this on the Feast of first fruits. Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 to 23. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Amazing. Paul is also associating the resurrection with first fruits and first fruits with the resurrection. Every Jew would get this. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all we be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, after that those who are in our Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. Jesus is the first to arise, and then us. Now, our understanding of the next Sunday, the Sunday of the resurrection as well. We understand the resurrection in a deeper, more profound way. But why start counting? God says to count seven Sabbaths, seven weeks. Count 49 days, Sabbath to Sabbath. And day 50 is another appointed time, the Feast of Shavuot. The Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. Shavuot is Hebrew for weeks. Pentecost is Greek for 50. The Greek of the feast is Pentecost. The Hebrew of the feast is Shavuot. God is clearly connecting the crucifixion to the resurrection. The resurrection is connected to the Feast of First Fruits. And now the Feast of First Fruits is connected to Shavuot or Pentecost. Now let's understand a little geography. In Jesus' day, the first harvest was the barley harvest, and that happened at Passover. Seven weeks later, the wheat harvest came, and that happened at Pentecost. So there was a second harvest, the harvest of the wheat at Pentecost. And no wheat is harvested until Shavuot, until that feast. So a countdown has begun. Jesus said, stay in Jerusalem before he ascends to the Father. Stay here. Stay until the second harvest of wheat. And what happens on Shavuot in Jesus' day? He ascends to the Father. He is the first fruits of those who arise from the dead. He is the first harvest. And there is the second harvest. 3,000 people were added to the church on Shavuot. We're seeing a picture of the final harvest. We're sent out. We're sent out we're our workers because the fields are white for the harvest. The wheat fields of this world, our job is to be his fellow workers with him to bring in the harvest of new believers and new disciples. The final harvest began in 30 AD on the seventh Sunday after the Feast of Bikurim, the seventh Sunday after the day of resurrection. And the harvest the harvest that began at Shavuot in 30 AD will end when Yeshua returns. So one might say that the Feast of Bikurim 
The Feast of the Resurrection is the end of the beginning. And that the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Pentecost, is the beginning of the end. We have one final session coming up, session four. In this session, we'll focus on the new covenant of, at the mountain of God in Jerusalem. We know that's related to a new covenant at Sinai, which Sinai was called the mountain of the Lord. We're going to focus in on the bread and the ram. When you have a one-year-old male lamb, it's an adult. Male lambs become mature, become adults at six months, so they could be called rams. And we're going to talk about the fact that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And Jesus is the Ram of God. And we'll need to see how significant that is. To, and again, enhance what is happening in Passover. So until then, I wish you God shalom. <laughs>